very beginning, we said this is going to be a great book because it's going to really encourage us, okay? We talked every single week. I'm still ringing. I think he's got the, uh, the treble or something up. I mean, you can turn down just a little bit more. Let's see if it helps a little bit. That's okay. We talked every week about this, and we'll talk about it again tonight, okay? Because this is what the whole book of Ephesians encapsulates. And this is what, if you don't learn anything else, you need to learn this. You have to learn this. Otherwise, you miss the whole teaching of the book of Ephesians. Number one, it talks about our heavenly calling, which equals where we are sitting. Sitting, sitting. So the first one would be sit. All right? Our earthly conduct is about our walk, exactly. About the way we walk with God. And our position is in Christ is where we stand. Stand, right. Sit, walk, stand. And so the whole book of Ephesians, again and again, I mean, it just hammers this again and again and again. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Our conduct is how we walk with the Lord and how we are to move with Him. And then when the enemy comes in, when Brenda takes it in, in April the 5th, on Wednesday nights when she teaches on the armor of God, she's going to talk about the power of our standing we can stand against the wiles of the enemy because we are sitting with Christ, we're walking with Christ, and we have our position in Christ that we can stand. Number three, our horizontal relationship is with who? People. It can be man, others, people. If you have anything besides yourself or God, that would be right. Okay. So you're talking about others. So our vertical relationship would be with who? Christ, God, Christ. Yes, absolutely. In the Old Testament, and this is where Paul said, I, I, you know, that, that God had uh, opened up our understanding. He said, I pray that your eyes of your understanding be open, da, 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 da. In the Old Testament, their eyes were not open. In the Old Testament, God's will was revealed or shown to them how? Progressively. Jeez, Kathy, Joe, you're on top of it. I only know that because I read it. Okay, all right. Was brought, it, was, it was given to them progressively. Little. Aggressively. Pro, progressively. Little progressively, little by little by little, it was it wasn't unveiled to them 100. percent They had no idea of what we're even talking about tonight. They could not even comprehend it. But Paul also said, when it came to us, then God has what? Mysteries. Nope. Revealed. Revealed, revealed the mysteries. Revealed. It's the mysteries are are shown. If you got shown or revealed, you got it. May are made known. Right. Well, I said mysteries. Mysteries was what he was talking about, but the answer was not mysteries, so you don't get a half a boy. Revealed, okay? So it was revealed that, that God revealed to us. Paul talked about that clearly last week, remember? That now that as, as, as believers, because of the cross, the purpose of Christ was com is completely revealed to us, and no longer are we in, in darkness, but now we are in the marvelous what? Light, the light of enlightenment, the light of understanding. So just count the number that you got right and write it at the top of your page without your, without your uh, name on it and collect those and turn them into me so I can have an idea of what kind of a teacher I am, okay? All right. If Kathy Joe, if you would just kind of collect them at your table. If Rick, you'll collect them at yours. And, uh, okay? Hey, we won't do this every week. But well, we're going to do at least a couple more times, so make sure you read your notes. I, you know, we, we're not just killing trees to kill trees. They're, your notes are for your study. And uh, thank you, guys. So really, if you did that, it's your fault. Yeah. You could say that if it was true. <laughs> but if it's not true, <laughs> I'm not receiving it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> He's about to get hit with a hammer. All right. All right. Hey, let's get let's get right into it. We didn't get through everything last week because hey, just a couple of quick announcements. Those of you watching online as well too, you'll get this as well too. Uh, this Sunday night is the gathering right here at Sunrise Christian Church at six o'clock p.m. Uh, it's a time of intercessory prayer and worship. It's a great time. Next Sunday is our Taste of Home family dinner here at the church. Everybody's welcome to stay. Uh, sign up yet? Make sure you sign up. If you didn't get anything signed up, try to sign something up. Jason, you don't have to because Jason's going to be in Florida. Florida. He's going to be in Florida eating uh, 
oranges and strawberries and uh, the like. But uh, anyway, so that's the 26th. And uh, if you don't cook, you can pay somebody else to cook for you. I'm sure they'd be willing to do that. But uh, Sunday, March the 12th, um, we'll be having holding our annual business meeting. And, uh, and so everybody's welcome to that. When are you coming back, by the way? You won't be back, will you? All the 12th? Okay. You know what? I'm gonna, I might make that uh, by Zoom available. So you may be able to watch it online if you're really interested. If not, we'll fill you in on the details. Yeah. Yeah. I'll need to talk to you before you get away. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, covenant membership class, y'all members, I think, in here, so that doesn't fly for any flight. Okay. Well, last week we started to go through the end of, of, it's been a long process getting through this first chapter because there's so much stuff that is there. The next chapter, when we get to chapter two, we're going to fly through the whole chapter in one night. Chapter three's got a couple, and then uh, chapter four has a couple. Chapter five, uh, we can probably get through all in one, one setting. Chapter six, we'll have half of it. I'll do half. And then April 5th, does anybody know what's going on April 5th? Brenda's got a class. Yeah, we're going to be at it. It's 6 o'clock right here. Yay! And <laughs> so pray for her. <laughs> All right. So turn, turn back your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's finish this up tonight, get through it, and, and we can get through it. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff in this, in this last part. Uh, because Paul's prayer um, that he gave was specifically... That their hearts would be open and enlightened in the eyes of their understanding be open so that they could comprehend just who they are now in Christ. You know, the devil would come and tell you who you're not. He loves to do that. The good thing, the good thing that we have is the word of God that counteracts the lies of the devil. So if you're feeding yourself upon the word of God and you're filling your heart with the word of God, when the enemy comes against you and he begins to tell you who you're not, you can quickly go to God's word and let him know exactly as you speak it by faith. I am the righteousness of God by Christ Jesus and I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. I'm an heir. We're going to see tonight. We're the very heir of God. We are, we are, the, we are the heritage of God. And so you have the rights and the privileges of a child of God. So let's read tonight. Let's go ahead and go back to, to 15. That's where we were last week and we didn't get through all this. We'll be reading 15 through 23. And it says, and I'm reading for the sake of those that are online tonight so they can hear. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of the saints, do not cease to give, this is Paul speaking, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above the principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in the age, uh, this age, but also that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, speaking about Jesus, uh, God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen and amen, amen, amen. So Paul, Paul goes in after he spoke to us last week, about he mentioned about he was excited and praying uh, for us because is this still ringing too bad? It is. It is. Crystal, can you go cut? Can you cut this one off? And just, you know how to turn the other mics on? Okay, turn Pastor's mic off and turn. Yeah, the extra one. Uh, why don't you why don't you turn on? Um, Jessica's number five is already on, so I can use that one. Okay. All right, I can do that. So um, let me turn this one off. Okay. So he says, he says here that the, Paul continues on after he, he speaks about that we understand with greatness of what God has done for us and how he has 
you know, seated at this place. Then he prayed that our eyes would be open and that we would have revelation in the knowledge of him, that we would have understanding and we would be enlightened. And uh, then he went into that and he, and he says, you know, you have been enlightened. It's been revealed to you. And so you can, you can go ahead and experience the fullness of what God has. And we stopped there last week in, in, of how God has revealed himself to us as the body of Christ. And he says, this is a prayer I, I want to pray for you. And I've been praying for you. And so Paul prays that they would have understanding in regards to everything that God gave to them through Jesus. And I want you just to lay your hands on yourself and close your eyes and say this with me. Okay, are you ready? I got my eyes closed too. Say this out loud. I need understanding of what God has for me and everything God has for me in the name of Jesus. You need to speak that to yourself regularly. You need to speak your name. I need to say, Glenn, you need to have understanding of everything that God has given you through Christ Jesus. You need that. You need to build yourself up and help yourself to understand that God has given you so much. Paul says, this is my prayer that you understand. He said, I pray that your eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling, God's calling over your life. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? The first thing he says, your, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. He, he, what he was trying to say, Ephesians, people of Ephesus, if you have any hope of knowing of what God has in plan for your life, you have to begin to walk supernaturally and let God open your eyes to what he has for your life. And people say, well, you can't know everything that God has for you in the future. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is that he would open your understanding that you would be enlightened to the will of God for your life as you begin to step by faith in God's will, then you can begin to take those first steps and second steps and, 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 and next steps until you begin to walk supernaturally with the understanding of the will of God for your life. The will of God is revealed to you as you move forward in Him. People get stuck in this, in this point, and I just want to say this real quick, I don't want to belinger this because you could preach a whole night on this. People get stuck right here because they want to know the whole will of God for their lives. Pastor, pray for me. I need to know God's will so I can move forward with him. Well, what is, what is the known will of God right now for your life? Rick, what is God's will for your life right now? Um, that I live daily for him. Then, right. Then you move in that. And so how do I move forward to having a relationship with God and moving with God, well, then I feed myself on the Word of God. I take time in prayer. I take time to study the Word of God. You move into things that you know, okay? So some of us, God has revealed himself more for the will of our life than others. But wherever you're at with your walk of God, with God, right now you have a responsibility before God to walk with what you know that you're supposed to be doing. New believers may not have as much enlightenment as what God is wanting them to do as some of us that have been down the road a bit. I don't expect that Rachel will walk in the same understanding of the will of God of what I, I believe that Bev should. Why? She's been seasoned many years under great teachers and preachers and anointing and revivals and in the word and what? Yeah, the Bible itself, put it in her word. Rachel is a few years into her walk with God and she's gleaning more understanding and she's growing and she's a lot further than she was when she was sitting in that second row back there when she first came. She's come a long ways, baby, but she's not to where God wants her to be yet. And so the known will for Bev is different than the known will for Rachel. Nonetheless, God has given them both understanding and it will take the work of the Holy Spirit supernaturally to even open their eyes more because even Bev at the places where she's at in her life, she's still not done until she breathes her last breath. So the will of God is not completely known 100% until she is done with her living. Rachel is not done until she is done with her living. But until that time, we each have a responsibility before God to walk with the understanding and the enlightenment of the will of God. And that's what Paul was saying here to the, 
the church of Ephesus. He was praying that your eyes of your understanding will be open and you'll understand the supernatural work that God is wanting to do in your life and that you'll get moving forward with it and allow the power of the Holy Spirit to move forward with it. He told them that it was going to require that their eyes of understanding be enlightened. What, what does that mean? That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That there be revelation, knowledge that will come. You can, you can move in the, in the, in the, in the known. Uh, we just see there's things we know that we need to do, whatever. But there's things in the spirit realm that we don't know. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit to show us. And that's where God is wanting to take each and every believer. There's certain things that you know to this point. Here's the danger of this, of knowing things. You can come to the place where you know things and you can just operate in the things you know and stop growing in Christ because you've stopped allowing the Holy Spirit to bring enlightenment into your spirit and show you more than what you know right now. That's the danger. That's exactly what happened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jesus' time. They had a lot of knowledge of the law and the things of the law, but their understanding was closed to the spiritual things of Christ. When Jesus showed up, they refused to, to, to allow the Holy Spirit to open their eyes to the understanding of what God was going to do with them. So Paul was saying, you need this, I'm praying for this. Paul uses this, this expression here when he speaks of the eyes of their, their heart, the eyes of their heart, or their understanding of their heart. Uh, the heart is a more literal than understanding. Because when he says the eyes of your heart or speaks about your heart, it takes a person somewhere. He uses this expression um, as he speaks about this. Um, a lot of Christians, and this is number one on your handout, so get ready to, to fill in that first little blank. Too many Christians have no eyes. Or excuse me, too many Christian hearts, hearts have no eyes. Places where they gain real knowledge and understanding. They have, their hearts have no eyes. Number two, and too many Christian, what do you think the eyes, eyes have no heart? But God wants us to have both. He wants us to have eyes of understanding and he wants us to have a heart. Number three, the word heart in scripture is used here to speak to the very core of the center of a person's life. When you hear the word heart in the scripture, are you somebody is teaching about your heart, is talking about your very core. So when I say your, your heart, your very core, what do I mean by that? Your, your very core. What's your it's the, Yeah. It's the down, down, yeah, down. Kathy, if I say core, what do you say? The core, uh, core of who Kathy really is. Everything. It's your it, right. It's the it's the balance of of everything that you you've invested into who you are. It's 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 who you are. Your heart is who you are. You'll hear you'll hear people say, you know, I know da 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 da, but I know their heart. What are they saying? They're saying it might look like this, but I know who they really are. That is not who they are. Because I know, their, I know who they are. I know their heart. There's two parts of that. The Bible says nobody knows the heart of man except for the spirit and the man. And so nobody can really know 100% what's in the heart of man. But the heart that is referred to here that Paul is saying here is that our hearts are the very center, the core of who we are. And it's from that that he goes on to pray this prayer. He said, I pray at the core of who you are, from the very center of who you are, that you know what the hope of his calling is. Paul wanted them to know because there would be very few things in life that would hold them and secure them in their walk with God and life as a whole other than specifically knowing the hope of the calling of God upon a person's life. Donna. It's kind of like when a new Christian becomes a believer and they start soaking in the word, but yet their carnality has not been polished yet. Yeah. And so they still have that abruptness or gruffness to them. Right. And then you say, I know their heart. Right. I know what they really mean, right. even though they come off yeah. as hard. Yeah, I know that they, tr they truly do have a hunger for God. And down deep inside who they really are, there is a gentleness there. There's a love that's right. there. There's a whatever that's there. 
because the, it goes it goes beyond the exterior. Remember, we are body, soul, and what? Spirit. Our soul realm is our um, our, is our mind, willing, emotions. Our spirit man is that part that is saved by God, and God is working on it, making us who we are. Our flesh is neutral; it will never be saved or anything else. It just hangs around and does what either the soul or the spirit tells it to do. And so, uh, uh, what Paul is getting to is really past the soulish realm of our mind, will, and emotions. It gets the very spirit of who we are now in Christ. We are new creatures sitting at, at, with, with Christ in heavenly places. Our conduct is to walk with him, and our position is who we are. I'm a child of God. So my, I sit and walk and stand in Christ with, with the confidence of knowing who he is. And Paul said there's nothing more that will give you greater confidence in your walk with God than knowing that God has called you and he wants to help to move you forward to a very specific thing in your life. Now, I want you to hear me here because too many people that call themselves Christ followers just think, okay, I prayed the, uh, the sinner's prayer, now I'm saved, that's all there is to it. No, 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 no. That's the entrance door into the kingdom of God where God now says, now I'm your Lord and I have access to it. I can do anything with Crystal that I want to do because she's now my child. And Crystal, I've got a plan for you, Jeremiah 29, 11 says. Thoughts and plans that you don't even know about. But they're good plans. And the, the purpose of God is to show those plans and that calling what he has for our life to move us forward into the hope of that calling. Paul says, I pray that you, that you grasp the hope of the calling of God that he has for your life. You're not just been born and created in this world just to hang around some 89, 100 years and then poof, you're gone. No, it's during the course of your walk in this world that after you've given your heart to me, uh, God is saying to us here, what Paul is trying to say, that now that hope is the calling that I have called you to myself, I've redeemed you to myself, and now I have a purpose and plan for your life. Listen, your, your life has a purpose. And it's not just to hang around the edges and watch what God does. It's for you to jump in like, I, I'm trying to remember, was it Jeremiah that gave the prophecy? I think it was. He said, I came to the river, and by the river, um, he said, I, 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 I was instructed by the Lord to, to, to go out into the water. And I went in, and first I went, was it uh, Jeremiah or Ezekiel? One of the two, anyway. And, and he said, so I stepped in, and I went in how deep? I waited in ankle deep. I went in. He says, ankle deep. And the spirit says, oh no, come on out further. So he comes in and he goes up to knee deep. And the spirit is saying, no, no, come in. I'm inviting you to come in. And he says, so I go in waist deep. And he, I'm in the water. And the spirit says, no, uh, this is not the place. It's deeper yet. Come into the water. And he's, you know, he's wooing him to come in. So he says, I come in, I'm chest deep. And the Spirit says, no. He says, come all the way into the water. And he says, so finally I plunge myself into the water, and the water began to carry me. See, here's the deal. God has a call on our life that needs to be fulfilled. But we will never fulfill the call of God's life if we are satisfied being ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, chest deep. Why? Because we don't know it all. We don't know it all, but the... When you're, when, you're in the, when you're in the water and, and you still have your feet underneath you, who's in control? You're in control. You're in control. But when you get in water that's moving and your feet are un, out underneath you, those that have been in the waters and your canoe's tipped over <clears throat> and the water's a little swift, that water will carry you. It'll take you somewhere. Uh, if you're smart, you'll keep your head above water so you can breathe a little bit. And uh, my wife and myself went down the Arkansas uh, uh, Rapid River in uh, Colorado. We went up about, uh, it was about almost 13,000 feet, I believe it was. And way up to the very tops of the mountains, our oldest son convinced us to, to do that. So we went into training for months and months and months, and we went whitewater rafting. And uh, we had to go through this training uh, before you go, you know, because probably you're going to die. But at least get... <laughs> At, at, least, at least we'll give you a chance to show you how not to. And so they said, if you fall out of the ra raft, there's a good chance you may, uh, because there's places that are so, they're so rough that we may get thrown out. But if you do, he said, when, when you go in, he said, there'll be places that um, they call them hydraulic pools or something like that. And that hydraulic pool, if you fall into the water, it will take you right down to the, to the bottom of the, of the, uh, um, the river. 
He said, when you, when, you, when you come out and you feel yourself going down and you go down, you'll touch the bottom. He said, put yourself in a cannonball position and hold that position and hold your breath and just hold it. He said, because in just, in just seconds, it might seem like forever, it's going to shoot you out and you're going to come down the river. And he said, we'll catch you after you get down that hydraulic. Well, by that time, my heart's beating thinking, I don't want to do this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but he was, he was preparing us to let us know the power of the water that could carry us on down the river a little bit. At that point, you're not in control. But do you know that's where God wants you to be? He doesn't want your feet on the bottom where you're controlling everything. He wants you to be in the deep water where his spirit and his water can carry you where he wants to take you. That's the hope of the calling. That's the freedom that we have in Christ as we follow after his will. If anybody wants to go to Arkansas River or the Arkansas R Rapid River with us sometime, we'll, we'll get a trip and we'll go down together. We did not. Our raft, our raft really did well. We fought it and we fought it hard. The worst part of that whole trip was at the end, there's this huge waterfall. And you can hear that thing roaring. But, and, and, he said, and he says, now, get ready because we're going to go over. And I'm looking at him and saying, what do you mean we're going to go over? He said, when we get to the very edge, he said, listen to me, listen to me. He said, I'll tell you, lean back. And when I say lean back, you better lean back as far as you can lean. And sure enough, we got there. He screamed. And, you know, he's like a professional, professional guide. And he says, lean back. And when he said that, man, boom, back we went. And we were leaning this way. And the next thing we saw was everything in front of us. I'm thinking, oh, you look down and whoosh, we went through it. I thought then I was going to come out. Boy. But you put your legs underneath and you wrap yourself. And it was a lot of fun. But it, there was parts that was scared the bejeebus out of you. But the power of water that carries you, and Paul is saying the hope of the calling God, that kind of power will carry you through life to places that, um, that you never dreamed of. Number four on your, on your paper there. He says, I pray that you understand the hope of your calling. Because the, for the believer, they have a glorious future of resurrection. Aren't you glad to know tonight that if you die, take your last breath as a child of God, you die, you're not just going to go to the grave and stay, but the resurrection power of God is going to raise you from the dead one day. Resurrection, eternal life, and freedom from sin. Aren't you thankful for freedom from sin? Freedom from sin is the next line. Perfected justification, just like your sins have never happened, he washes them away. And the glorious elevation above the angels of themselves. We are, we are seated higher than the angels of heaven because of Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory. He continues to go on here and he wants them to know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Paul, Paul said to them, he says to them, I want you to know something. I want you to know the greatness of God's inheritance in his people. He, he says this to the, to the Ephesians. That he said, I want you to understand just how precious you are to God that he has considered you his very own inheritance. Just think about this. God has everything in the universe. He owns everything. But he has an inheritance. And that inheritance is you. That's what Paul was saying here. The very most precious thing in the whole universe and the whole cosmos in everything that there ever was being created you are still the most precious thing to God. You are God's inheritance. Just close your eyes and say that tonight. I am God's inheritance. I am God's inheritance. And start thinking about that. What does that mean? What does it mean to God? God looks at you different. He looks at you in a way that, that blesses his heart. Um, for those of you that have ever had an inheritance, or you're waiting on your inheritance maybe, we knew before my mom and dad died because they put me on their living trust. I knew exactly what was going to take place. Now I didn't. I did. I, I never. I never wished my mom and dad to die. Never did. I was never. I was never. You know, hoping that this hurry up and take place so I can because I know what's coming. But when I saw that, I thought I. I it made me humbly grateful. That my mom and dad loved me so much, and that our other, my other four brothers and sisters, my brother and, and three sisters as well too, that they thought about us with an inheritance, and it blessed me so. It blessed me so. 
And when, when, I thought, when I thought about that, Paul wanted us to understand. And, and, I, and when I saw that, and I saw, you know, they did something for me that I could never do for myself. And it was a great thing, and I, I thank God for, for what they did. But Paul says, see, I want you to understand the greatness of God's inheritance for his people and his people. I want you to understand that he is showing you. And he, he's right now, before, before it's all over, He's showing you right now his inheritance, and his inheritance is you. God cannot wait to be in your presence. We say, wait a minute, that's backwards, isn't it, Pastor? We can't wait to be in God's presence. Well, that's true, but God can't wait for you to be in his presence. The Bible says, blessed in the sight of the Lord are the death of those he loves. Now, for us, we think, man, that's morbid. <laughs> God, what? No. Because at your death, when you breathe that last breath, you will then be able to be received by God as his inheritance that he's waited so long. How many, how many years have you been around, Bev? 91. Rick, how long have you been around? 59 and holding. Jer Jeremy's still under the 50 mark yet. Rachel, I should, 63. Six, 63 years, Rachel, God has been waiting till he could hold you right at this point. We pray it ain't over yet. Yeah. He, to this point, he's waited 63 years to hold his inheritance in his arms. And on that day, whatever that day be, be it 10 years or 50 years, the day will come, you breathe your last breath. As a child of God, the very presence of God will come and usher you into the presence of the Father who you belong to, his inheritance, and you will be presented by Jesus to the Father and God will receive his inheritance of Rachel unto himself. I don't know what that does for you, but that's encouraging. That's encouraging. This life of living, Paul said, this life of living for God, it's worth it. We're his inheritance. We have an inheritance. We are seated in heavenly places. We're walking with God. And I have a position in Christ that no matter what the enemy does, I can withstand and stand under the power of God because uh, Ephesians 6 will tell us that in April the 5th. But anyway, Paul, Paul continues his prayer, his prayer here. <laughs> I couldn't leave that one. I just couldn't. Paul continues here with his prayer. And he prays, he goes on to pray. He said, I pray the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, if you have something, if you have a Bible where you can circle that, us who believe. You need to circle that, underline it, do something. For five, it's power. <laughs> uh, number five, we're not there yet. No, 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 no. Well, number five, I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and move on to that. Number five, Paul wanted them to know the great power of God is toward us who believe. Power, yep. There's number five. So he says to them, he said, I want you to understand the power of God, how it works to the, towards us who what? Why is that word believe so important? Because there's a condition. It's faith. Right, what's that word? What did you say? Faith. faith. The condition is faith. You cannot be saved. People will say, because here's what Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If we confess our sins before him, he tells us that faithful and just whatever. He said, but if you confess with your mouth and what? Believe in your heart. So the confession of your mouth is not enough to be saved. People will tell you, well, just make a confession. Just ask Jesus in your heart. That's all there is to it. No. You can say words, and those words will mean nothing. It is not until the truth of those words moves upon your heart and you receive it, what Bob said, you receive it by faith, and you say, you know what? Those words are true. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he was born of a virgin Mary. I believe that he walked some 30, 33 and a half years on this earth spotless. I believe he went to the cross. I believe he died for me. I believe he was buried 
and on the third day he rose. I believe that for 40 days after that he walked with the disciples teaching them the principles of the kingdom. I believe that he ascended back to the Father and I believe right now he is seated at the right hand of God making intercession for me. None of that works in your life unless you what? Believe. believe. You have to believe. What Paul is saying here, Paul continues with this. He said, I pray that you would understand the exceeding greatness of the power of God toward us who believe. I only, I only drill down on that because I'm just telling you right now, the power of God will never work in your life unless you believe it. Unless you believe the word of God. Not just read it, not just hear about it, not even just speak it a little bit. You need to get it down inside of your spirit. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. Getting the word in our heart and letting it go down deep. And to establish that believing that we can stand with God. Because it's when we believe and we speak to God by faith in that believing and bringing our requests to him boldly. I think probably the book of Hebrews said that. That we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Absolutely. And not just say, I can't have any other way. That's yeah. the way it, it's going to be. Has anybody ever tried to, to, treat, to teach you or train you something? And they had a little bit of idea of what, they, what, it, what it was to do. It. They had some knowledge of it, but they really didn't have a thorough understanding of it. And then you have a master who really knows what they're doing, and they try to train that person, and that person will not be trained because that person has a little bit of head knowledge and they have a thought about it, but it doesn't line up with the truth and have faith in the person. Let's say, for instance, Rick. Rick is a master carpenter. He really is. He doesn't give himself credit as he should. He's a master carpenter. Uh, does great cabinetry, pr trim work, flooring. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some of the stuff he's done. Just beautiful, gorgeous. And uh, some of you have been the, the recipients of that. Very good. I have a little knowledge about things just enough to get me in trouble when it comes to carpentry. I need people like Rick in my life. <laughs> but what if I come to Rick and I say, Rick, okay, I want you to, sh I want you to show me how, I got a little, about, a little idea how to do flooring or, 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 or trim work. I know how to do a little bit of trim work. But Rick really knows how to do the cuts and the angles and he can cut both ways. I can cut only one way. And, and so he's trying to show me and, but I don't listen and I don't, what Bev says, I don't throw myself onto Rick and say, I am willing to learn everything that he has to show me. And I just wrestle against that. Can I ever really become a, a good carpenter? No, because I refuse the touch of the master's hand in my life. Have to be teachable. That's right. That's right. Have to be more teachable than you can. And no matter how old you are, no matter how old or young you are, you have to be willing to truly be taught the things of God. And you have to be willing to abandon some things that you've been taught that are not truth with God. You know, years and years ago, years ago, this was long before y'all was around. And before, well, some of you were around during the time, but some of this is new to some of you. But there was, there was teachings in the old days that you could not drink coffee. Um, ladies, ladies you, you could drink Coke, right? Ladies could not wear makeup. They could not cut their hair. Um, it was unsanctified. Um, they could, you could not um, uh, attend certain places. If alcohol at all was served, you couldn't go there. Um, no you cards. know, what's that? No cards. No cards was it? Yeah. And I'm, ta I'm talking about for my own. This is what I grew up grew up with a lot of this stuff. Um, on and on, on different things. Listen, those people love God with all their heart, and they and they they are they. They are wonderful, wonderful people of God. But some of the things that they took in regards to those to, to write their, their statements of, and they weren't, they weren't doctrine, they were called practical commitments. Uh, here, here was another one, you can't go to the movies, you can't go to theaters. My mother told me, Glenn, you can go to the theater if you want to. But when, when, when the catching away of the church takes place, and... Uh, we are caught up to go with him. If you're in that theater, you will not go to be with the Lord. Did she believe in 
And she believed it because she was taught and trained that. There was no real biblical foundation for that. Oh, here, here's another. Let me give you some scriptures. Um, <clears throat> um, money is the root of all evil. How many times did you hear that years of forever? Is that love or, or is that true or not? The love, he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not evil because money is neutral, just like your flesh is. Here's another one. You'll, you'll hear people say, you know, a lot of the old timers say this whole time. Cleanliness is next to. They believe that was in the Word of God. And it wasn't. It just wasn't. It just wasn't. And so there's, there's this understanding of, of not just having, having a knowledge of things. But like Bev says, we've got to be willing to throw ourselves completely onto the truth of the Word of God and find out what God's Word says about this. Find out what it says about the issues and about the things. And there's some, there's some standards that are there, absolutely, that we are called to live by, by faith. And holiness is one of them. Holiness is one of them. But Paul is clear in many parts of his teachings that holiness does not come from the external standards but it comes from the heart. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't open the door for us to live any old way we want or to live in sin or fornication or drunkenness or any of that. But we walk according to the Spirit. And, and, and that comes as we throw ourselves on to the, to the Word of God. And Paul is saying here clearly that we, we can never know the full power of God until we choose to believe the truth of God and understand who He is. So as followers of Jesus... We should know we serve a God of love, absolutely, but also we serve a God of power who is showing his strength to us on a daily basis. He wants to show, God wants, he says, God's word says that he wants to show himself mighty to us in every aspect of our life. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're faced with tonight, the strength of God is greater than the challenge you're going through. The power of God is bigger than the opposition that the devil is throwing into your face right now. And when you, when you come to the place of understanding that I sit with Christ, I, 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 I walk with him daily, and I stand with him, when the enemy rises up against me, then I, can ha I have the, the power of God, of the one who all strength and power that is in the whole universe, the loving God, his power is shown to me because of Jesus who is in me. And because I am a child, because I'm his heir, he shows his strength to me on, on the behalf of his love for me. And so you can call on the power of God. You can call on the strength of God to help you. And so many, so many Christians don't know this power. They just don't. They've never been taught about it. Or they know about it and they, and they only know about it from a distance. They don't want to get too close to the power of God because they're afraid of it. But listen, God wants that resurrection power to be manifest in your life. The, the, as the believer, he wants his manifest power to show forth in you. Charles Spurgeon, the great, the great, great preacher, uh, commentator in his comment, in commentator, he said this in his, in his books. He said, the very same power which raised Christ is waiting to raise the drunkard from his drunkenness, to raise the thief from his dishonesty, uh, dishonesty to raise the Pharisee from his self-righteousness, to raise the Sadducee from their unbelief. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is willing to raise the drunkard, the thief, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the homosexual, the lesbian. You fill in the blank for yourself, whatever you want to fill it in with. Whatever, whatever the enemy has brought against you, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that is now in you that can be activated to set you free by the power of God, whatever it is. You know what I believe? I believe in the same way that Paul prayed for the prayers in the day here in, 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 to the church of Ephesus. I believe as he prayed for his brothers and sisters that their eyes would be open, they would have understanding, that they would know the power of God, all those, all those prayers they pray there. I believe your prayers for spiritual growth and enlightenment are important for others as well. 
I believe God wants us praying for one another like just like this. When I'm in my prayer time and God, and God lays somebody on my heart that I stop and I say, Lord, I pray that the eyes of their understanding would be open. I pray that they would know who you are. I pray they'd know the power of God. And you know what? When we, when we pray for one another like that secretly, and maybe at times not even secretly, but I just come and lay your hands on them and begin to pray for them. There's power when you begin to pray. That's why the Bible says pray you one for another because you never know what person is going through. I was going through, I was going through a difficult time a while back and, uh, and I was reminded of something. When we were at Evangel Life in, uh, in Bad Axe every Sunday night, every Sunday night, every Sunday night, we came together in our fireside room, a beautiful little room off the side of the church. We had an octagon-shaped sanctuary. And off the side was this room that I, I pegged at the fireside room. And Sunday night, we'd come together and we'd pray. We'd pray and intercede every Sunday night. People come every, every Sunday night. And good turnout. And they would just seek God and seek God. There was, this, there was this brother that was there. His name was Art Ortega. And Art was an evangelist, traveled the, uh, uh, traveled the nation around the world, a saxophone player, preacher. And, uh, but he attended our church, him and his wife, Pat. And on Sunday nights, uh, Art, when he was in Bible college, they, they had experienced a great revival in, in the school where he was at at, at Central Bible College in, in Springfield, Illinois, or in Missouri. And uh, during that time, there, the, there was a, a word that came forth, and it included a, a scripture from Isaiah, I believe it was 51. Um, and it says, that the, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And art would just simply, there would be times when the holiness of God would be so rich in the house as we were praying, and it would get quiet. And then in a moment, that scripture would come on Brother Art. And he in that beautiful Latino, very clear English, but beautiful Latino sound in his voice, he would begin to speak that under the anointing of God. And you could just feel the, the um, outpouring of the strength of God as God was saying to us, don't be weary and running, keep walking. You're not going to faint. And I remember during that time, I... I uh, a couple a while back and I and I was just so I was weak and I just really needed a touch from God and God reminded me of Art Ortega and the words he spoke and I began to speak that and the refreshing of God that came over me I'm only saying all this to say this so this morning I was praying and God brings to my mind his wife Pat who is a phenomenal woman of faith she used to tell us God hears you with you when you pray and he answers you when you pray. You can believe God for what his word has said. And she was just a phenomenal woman, woman of faith. And uh, I felt impressed in my spirit to text a message to her. She's in a nursing home now. And I just said to her, Sister Pat, I wanted to tell you, and I told her the story I just told you. And I said, I want to tell you, I thank you for your faithfulness for you and Art as we pastored you that you were wonderful people to pastor and the encouragement you were to us. And went on, I just exhorted her. And I said, I want you to know that, you know, we're all getting closer to the end now. And uh, one day we're all going to, you know, we're going to hear Jesus say it's time and we're going to go. And I said a lot more than that, but that's all I'll share. I only did it because I felt the Holy Spirit said, do that to encourage her. Now of all the people in the world that I would ever think that we didn't need encouragement, it would not be Pat Ortega because she is, was always high and are, seemed to me that at least she was anyway, walking in faith and belief, whatever. But this morning, God impressed on my heart to let her know how much she meant to you and what that meant to you. Tell her that story. I don't know what she's going through. I don't know whatever, but I do know that. But I know that when she receives that, the way she is and the woman of God that she is, that God is going to use that word to touch Pat's life and something is going to spark in her heart and faith is going to rise in the name of Jesus with freshness. Yeah, the enemy will be scattered, amen. You never know when you pray for somebody what, what that's going to mean or what it's going to do, where, where they're at or what's going on. But you have to pray. You've got to be willing to pray. Let me get you to fill in the blank ones here because there's a lot going on. Your prayers for the spiritual growth of others will help them along the way. Number six, 
If Paul believed that it was important to pray for these things for the, the Ephesians church, I believe it's important for us to pray them for others and for ourselves. I believe you need to pray these over yourselves as well. He, says to, he went on to say, verse 19 through 21, he said, I pray that you'd understand the mighty power of God that, that is working according to the working of his power in, in your life. The power that works in us is the mighty power, number seven on your, your handout, is the mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead. The scripture says, if that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken what? Your mortal bodies. So the great power of God that, that touched Jesus, that raised him the, from the dead, is exactly the same power that now is working in you. And it can raise you from your dead situation as well too. Whatever looks like dead can come back to life again because the power of God is working in us because of what Jesus did at the cross. That same power that raised him from the dead is the same power that will raise you. Number eight, with this mighty power available to us, there never needs to be a power shortage in a Christian's life. Never needs a power shortage. You don't, have, you don't have to walk around half juiced up. You can be filled with the power and the spirit of the living God. There he is, 1-800-CALL-HEAVEN. Yeah, <laughs> call Jesus now, amen, amen. One commentator said this, I love what it said. It says, if the death of Christ is a super demonstration of the love of God, then the resurrection of Christ is the super demonstration of his power. I'll say it again. If the death of Christ is the super demonstration of the love of God, then the resurrection of him coming out of that tomb is the super demonstration of the power of God. That power that can raise Jesus from the dead is the same power that can raise you, can raise you tonight, right now. Whatever's going on, whatever looks like it's dead, you have the faith of the God to believe in the power of God. Speak to that mountain and say, come back in the name of Jesus. Number nine, it says that he seated him at the right hand, that they would have understanding to see these things. See him, see Jesus right now sit, sitting at the right hand of the Father. It was the mighty power, the mighty power, number nine on your hand out there, that raised Jesus to heaven after his resurrection, raising him above all the demonic forces, all the potential enemies, and even Satan himself. When God set Jesus on the right hand of him in heaven, Jesus went and he fell to that power of authority, and now he is seated at the right, right now, right this second, Jesus is sitting next to the Father and he's speaking to the Father on your behalf. Well, yeah, but pastor, I mean, there's millions and billions of people. Yeah, I know that. You know what? God is omnipotent. All Jesus has to do is look at him and God will know. And he's speaking about us. You know, and, and one of the scriptures says this, that your name is written on, on, the, on the palm of God's hand. And so when he moves to do things, he's thinking about you. He's moving with you in mind. His power is moving with you in power and mind. Uh, number ten on your handout says this same power is at work in the Christian's life. It's at work in your life. The same power that seated Jesus on the right hand of God is now seating you. I'm going to say this, and we're going to jump way down real quick because of time tonight. In the Clark commentary, it's it's stated this. It said the right hand is the place of friendship of honor and confidence and authority. So think about this tonight. Jesus is seated, seating, sitting on the right hand of the Father tonight. On the right hand of the Father. The pla place of friendship, place of honor, place of confidence, and a place of authority. So Jesus has been placed in the place of honor and authority. And you as a child of God, and remember what Paul said in Ephesians, you are what? Sitting where? You're sitting with Christ in heavenly places. So Jesus tonight is on the right hand of the Father. And so by the Spirit, each one of us tonight, through Christ Jesus, we are sitting next to the Father's heart on the right side. And you know what we're sitting in? We're sitting in the place of friendship, of honor and confidence and authority. And so when you call upon God, you can, you can call upon him because you're a friend of God. He's your friend. 
You can call because he honors you out of his love. You have confidence. You have authority. Jesus says, all authority I've given unto you. And the very authority of God now rests within you as a child of God. Yes. Number nine. Let me go back and take a look. Um, number nine was seated at the right hand. It was the mighty power. Mighty power that raised Jesus. Did you say 11? Not yet. Not yet. I'm going to right now. <laughs> I am. So Paul says here, he says, this is where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He sits with uh, friendship, honor, confidence, and authority. Far above all principalities and all power and might and dominion. So everything, everything has to fall under the name of Jesus. Nothing can stand against it. God has put everything under his feet. All the things, demonic, Satan, principalities, powers, it's all under the feet in the name of Jesus. Does that say that in Hebrews? I can't remember if it's Hebrews or not. But every place, every place, everything, at principalities, all of it is under Jesus' feet tonight. And everything that the enemy has uh, you know, try to raise up to, to defeat the Lord or discourage the Lord or discourage you or defeat you. No, because you're in Christ Jesus, you're seated with him, you're walking with him, you're standing with him. That authority gives you all right and power to stand and speak against the works of the devil and say, no, Satan, in Jesus' name, you let it go and let me go in Jesus' name. Real quick, let me give it to you. He put all things under his feet because of the resurrection now it's under his feet. Not only is it under his feet, but the church now, he's the head over everything, including us. We are the church. The church is his body. And we understand. We need to understand what's being said here. Jesus is the head. The community of Christians makes up his body. And when the Lord returns, he will come back for his body. He'll come back for his bride, which is the church. Number 11, the church is the bride. And we are the bride. I thought you said it was the body. What's that? The body is his bride. The church is his body. So it's the same. same one and the same. Yep. Yeah. Michelle. The first one is called The Same Power That Raised Jesus this, from the Dead. Yes. And the second one is I Have Resurrection Power. I Have Resurrection Living on the Inside. Living on the Inside, that's right. By Chris Thomas. By Chris Thomas. He's just present. You know, he just dropped those songs into my mind. Music that is written in, in, with these kind of with these kind of um, verbiage and language are are the redundance of God's word that puts it in us, and we sing those, and it builds faith as we sing those words because that's the word of God. Christ is living on the inside of me. I do have resurrection power on the inside of me. Um, you sing these things that builds up your faith, and it, build, it builds you up in most holy faith. When we understand, Paul said, this whole first chapter, there's so much to it that's there. It would take you could really take a good, a good two or three months and and, and uh, you know expound on a lot of the stuff that's here. But the thing that Paul wants to say to us in the first chapter, he wants to get it out and get it clear. Number one, you have been seated with Christ. Number two, your walk with Christ is important. And number three is what. Your stand, your position, your position. Walk, or excuse me, sit, walk, stand. By the time we get done with the study, you're going you're gonna to know that 100%, amen? You're going to know what Ephesians is all about. It's about my position, or excuse me, it's about my place, it's about my walk, and it's about my position in Christ. Any, any, any quick comments before we skedaddle? Yes. Like you said, we're not finished. We have 
now to fulfill those plans. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. The point being made is what Michelle is saying. God has plans and thoughts. He has a purpose, but they are realized through who? Through me, through you. That's right. Point at yourself. Because the thoughts and the plans that God has for me, I have to walk them out. Now, he can begin to lead me. I can begin to know his will, but it takes me by faith, stepping with the will of God for my life. Right, right. He calls us out to salvation. Right, nobody can be saved unless the Spirit of man, uh, draws the man. Right, right. And so, I think that the, in the same way, when he does that, he, he's telling us, okay, well now I've done this, but there's more. Right. The there's more I have yeah. for you. The same Spirit that drew you to salvation is the same Spirit that's, that's drawing you not to watch things or listen to things or say things or act a certain way or to, to witness to somebody or to give or the same spirit that drew us to Christ is now the same spirit. Jesus said in John 14, 15, he says it's imperative that I go away so that when I go away, he, the spirit, might come. And when he comes, he will lead you into all truth pertaining to the things that God wants you to hear. God is speaking, but he's speaking by his spirit. And if you think you're going to hear God by the flesh, you're not. You have to spend time with God. I'll, let me conclude with this and we'll, we'll go. Those of you who are on, online, I was going to say goodbye, but I'll let you hear too. Right now in Kentucky, at, at Asbury College in Kentucky, some of you may have already heard this, there was a great revival that broke out, out five and a half days ago a camp, on, on campus at a chapel service. The, the, the minister preached on the love of God and repentance. And there was about 10 or 15 of the students that really got a hold of it. They went to the altar and they really began to press in and they would not leave. And they were seeking God and they were praying and they were worshiping. Chapel service tried to close, they couldn't, so they just left the students there to pray. The day went on, school went on, and by the time, and people began to drift back again into the, into the auditorium of the, uh, of the chapel that was there. By the time the evening time had come, the place was so packed that they could not get anybody else in the chapel. And it's been that way now for five and a half days. People are beginning to come from all around the world to be in the revival at, as Osbury College. The word now is other universities are beginning to have outbreaks of moves of God on their, on their campuses in the same kind of way. God is moving by his spirit. That comes from a people that have said, God, I want to hear from your spirit. What are you wanting to do? What do you want from me? And from a hard repentance, they begin to cry out, God, do in me what you want to do by your spirit. And when those hungry hearts reach the ears of God, God, by his sovereign spirit, said, I am just going to touch this place now. And today, and there's, no, there's no indication that it's letting up. You could go online tonight and it's going right now. Yeah, it's all over. It's all over Facebook. It's all over. It's beautiful. Those, those they're on their knees and their faces before God. Church, we, will ne we here at Sunrise Christian will never, ever have a genuine move of the Spirit of God until we surrender to the working of the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And that's what Paul was saying. When you understand what's on the inside of you and you begin to move according to his will for your life, Heaven's going to open up. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We repent from our sins and we're sorry tonight. We're sorry, God, for closing our ears and our spirits off to the truth of what your word says. We pray that you would help us to, that the eyes of our, of our heart would be opened, that our ears would be opened, that we would have understanding of who we are in you. We pray by your Holy Spirit that you would help us to walk and to follow after your heart. God, set this house ablaze with the fire of revival, I pray. Let our hearts be open to you, God. Help us not to be ashamed of the gospel. Help us not to be compromising 
to the things of this world and giving into worldly things and lo- worldly lusts and pleasures and, and desires and the things of the flesh that, Lord, are, are of, of no effect at all. They're just distractions. I pray our hearts will come alive in you again. And I pray for the areas of our heart that has become cold. Revive us, O oh God. Set our hearts alive again with revival. In the name of Jesus. There's no song that's saying, you know what it is. Revive us, O God. Fill our hearts with thy love. Let our souls be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill our hearts with thy love. May our souls be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us. Um, we all should say, God, revive me again. God, revive us again. Revive me again, Lord, I pray. God, be with us as we go our separate ways. God, give us a wonderful, wonderful evening of rest in your presence. Give us a great day tomorrow in your presence. If you delay your coming, help us to be able to share the gospel with somebody we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful night.